Hello and welcome to Telecom TV. I'm Martin Warwick, we're here in London's Docklands at the Small Cells World Summit 2015 and I'm talking with Alan Law who is the chairman of the Small Cell Forum. Alan, welcome, thanks for talking to us and really, not to be rude, you should be able to get something straight from the horse's mouth here, so um, let's begin. Small cells have been around for a while, as we both know, as everybody knows, and they've gone through several phases of evolution and appear in different places and different guises. Where do you expect to see small cell technology go over the next five years and why? And the reason I'm asking this is outside and in other places we're hearing a lot about changes to the network and the emergence of what's being called the 2020 network or network 2020, which relates very often to 5G. No, that's a really great question, Martin. Uh, and if, if I start a little bit with the foundations upon which we've built our work, yeah. which is our Small Cell Forum releases one to five, and they were very much about focusing on how to make the most of small cell technology, whether it was in the home, whether it was in enterprise, whether it was in urban areas or in rural and remote locations. And that was very much focused on what could you do to understand the challenges that you have and address those challenges. Now, now clearly things have moved on and now what we're seeing is much more diverse technological change. And the question's adapting into, okay, you have small cells, how do you work, make that work very well with Wi-Fi or other technologies? You've got new technologies such as LAA coming along. You've got virtualization, which has very much happened in the core networks today, but it's extending right down to the RAN networks right now. And what we've been working on in the Small Cell Forum and we've announced today is our release 5.1, which in a way you can consider foundations for virtualization. We released 12 documents, six of focused purely on virtualization and what the impacts are in the sense of small cells and how you can do that very well. So a very informative set of information. And the other documents are around some of the other changes that are taking place within the HetNet. So, you know, examples of that are the LAAP. So we have a document very much focused around making the most of uh, unlicensed, you know, which is very much this, this hot topic that, that you hear so much about today. And in terms of the work of the, the Small Cell Forum, you know, in our name, people think Small Cell Forum, Small Cells, but our work has actually grown beyond that. And very much the, the focus of our work right now is about making the most of small cells within this integrated HetNet. And that's, and that's you know, a core theme running through our work. And we've even adapted our mission statement as an organization to reflect that. So what's it changed to? I don't know what it is, honestly. Please tell me. So it used to, it's, it's really about uh, driving the, it's around driving the ecosystem for small cells. Yep. So helping growth in small cells and effectively having this effective integrated head net. So taking all of these technology choices that are there and bringing them and packaging them together in the right way and providing the information that operators and companies within the ecosystem need to make the most of those. Thank you. Now then, you mentioned this focus on virtualization, yes. which of course is being, I'm sure, spurred by network changes, SDN, NFV, yeah. and so on. Um, and you also mentioned various environments. The home fully understand, enterprise fully understand, rural and remote understand as well. Urban seems to me to have been the area where perhaps small cells haven't reached the potential they might have done. If you remember the hype and the chat of a couple of years ago, maybe three years ago, we were expecting by now to see small cells absolutely everywhere in the urban environment yeah. and that has not happened. Why is that? It's a very good question, Martin. Uh, and I think there are a number of factors that, that contribute towards that. Uh, I suppose, you know, for many operators have been uh, specifically in the urban and deploying small cells to add additional capacity to their networks. But for many operators, they've acquired recently LTE spectrum or have recently deployed LTE networks, which has allowed them as an interim measure to fill that gap. Now, if you cast your mind forward though, I think that the thing where everybody, you know, it's all right to, to think about today, but as you look forward, you know, as capacity needs will grow over the next five years, yeah. There is nothing more certain that, than the only way to fulfill that is by densifying and having small cells and very much in that urban area. And I think you'll see the numbers grow significantly within that sector. And even if you look, that, you know, this morning we presented some results that came from mobile experts and we showed growth in every sector, you know, home, uh, enterprise, 
urban, even urban as well, and in rural and remote, uh, that, that are effectively in the, the slides that were presented today, and you'll be able to see them in our market status report on our website. Uh, and as well as that, there's a, a very interesting forward-looking forecast that shows 32% uh, cumulative annual growth rate in small cell numbers across the whole sector as a whole. And we believe, through our advocacy and outreach, that we're driving harder with regionalised operator groups within the Small Cell Forum, that we'll continue to see that cumulative annual growth rate grow even higher and much further across every sector, including... So that. then, Alan, urban... Yes. Um, small cell isn't going to be a niche, it's going to be part of the mainstream and presumably the more so when closer we get to 5G? Absolutely, absolutely. You've hit the nail on the head there. So if you take 5G, when people are thinking about 5G, people are thinking, of, thinking about very high data rates and very low latencies. Now if you put those two things together, what you really need is, number one, you need a very good channel to use these higher order modulation techniques. And the only way you can do that is to get the transmitters closer together. So you need to put the cells closer to those users. They're using very high frequencies to have the bandwidths that you're looking to achieve. Again, the higher the frequency, you know, the more it tapers off, the worse the inbuilding penetration. Again, means you need to put the transmitters closer to the individual users. And then as you're pushing the latency limits, what you're starting to see is, you know, in a way this early evolution to virtualization is, is a starting point for that, is you're moving services and capabilities closer to the edge. You know, such as being defined in Etsy in the mobile edge compute. Indeed. But again, you're moving services to those small cells that are the edge of your network to give you that very high speed, very good channel and very low latency. So I fully believe and on heart, you know, small cells will be at the hub of the 5G technologies of the future. You're not the only one to say that, by the way. That's great. Well, That's you, say great. Very you say it very convincingly. <laughs> uh, you, you touched on, Alan, just now, one of the big controversies at the moment, which yeah. is what's being called generically LTEU or LAA in standard yeah. speak, as you mentioned. That's LTE across the public spectrum. How do you think LTE should be viewed? Let me put it in this context for you. One side yes. of the, uh, well, the anti-argument says, no, what this is is allowing the world's big players, the big operators, carriers and so on, to get a competitive lock on unlicensed spectrum and hang on to it for, you know, for as long and as hard as they can. Whereas the other side says, no, in the end, it's a user-friendly method of aggregating data to provide a better service to users. I can imagine which side you stand on this, but explain why. Okay, well, just to be clear, I stand in the latter camp there. And there I thought are, you might. Yeah, yeah and there, but there are, there are a number of things for me which, which support and underpin that. I mean, many people use Wi-Fi today, and I think if you think you can fully replace that, you know that's a very big ambition and the reality is is even the big players today I believe you know Wi-Fi is again is a fundamental part of, of what they will deliver and and the big players really then it comes down to the, that question how do I make the most out of the assets that I have and for me if you take the license spectrum it's licensed it allows you to plan it in a very nice and organized way you have the unlicensed component allows you to take and use in that opportunistic factor and you bring those technologies together then that really does allow you to make the most of it and as you move to to LAA which is in essence you could say you know taking opportunity opportunistic use and borrowing that unlicensed spectrum mm. from that band yep. and allow it to be used in a more effective way you know as you integrate those technologies and put them within one individual small cell it allows you to understand what's happening to all of your spectrum assets with those technologies at that same time. So I think there'll be, there'll be two things. I think, you know, the, the reality is we'll see LAA being used and it'll be used very effectively and in a fair way. And that'll be in the interest of everybody. You know, I can understand that, that people have some concerns, but I, you know, I honestly believe that. And then I'll, but I'll also think you'll see these technologies come together as well within the products. And, you know, and by doing that, you'll be able to make the most of it. Okay, thank you. To round off, um, you've been talking about technological change. I, w I would like to ask you, how do, how do you manage the process? How do you ensure that you build small cells and small cell systems in such a way to ensure its longevity and continuing relevance to the market? Well, I think, you know, that's why I'm very proud of our organisation in a way that we're an operator-led organisation. And 
uh, to be honest, successful operators listen to their customers. So, it's, it, you know, from the heart of what we do, we are thinking what will benefit the customers and what are the factors that you need to do that. You know, as we migrate through all of these te technological changes. And that's very much, you know, the work and the mantra that we're, that we're working to deliver on which is you know, understanding early the virtualization so operators understand as they're virtualizing the core, as they're virtualizing the RAN, how do they do that with small cells and do that in a way that can be sustainable and supportable for the foreseeable future and do it in a way that has a nice evolution towards 5G. So we're already reaching out to partnerships in relation to 5G to share our knowledge because we, again, believe it will be underpinned on small cells to share what we have learned through our journey of making small cell deployments healthy and successful. But we also want to learn from those bodies, you know, as they're dis making decisions and defining what's happening with 5G early, which allows us to plan that smooth journey. Okay, good answer, well argued. Thanks very much, Alan Law. No, thank you, Martin. Thank you.